Welcome to the online service from St. Mary's, Chalcombe and St. Stephen's Lansdowne, recorded especially for those of you unable to get to church today or simply exploring the Christian faith online. My name is Andrew Avramenko and it's a pleasure to be back with you for this informal service of readings, sermon and prayers. I've recently come back from a much delayed pilgrimage to the Holy Land and I'll be sharing a few thoughts, observations and photos from that trip in my message today. It's a message which links with our reading from Paul's letter to the Hebrews, so I'll be doing it something unusual and bring us our gospel reading first today rather than second. And with those opening notices said, let's begin our service with a prayer for today. Lord of heaven and earth, as Jesus taught his disciples to be persistent in prayer, give us patience and courage to never lose hope, but always to bring our prayers before you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so, our Gospel reading for today is taken from Luke's, the Gospel according to Luke, from chapter 13, verses 10 to 17. Now, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he, set, when he laid hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue Indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it to water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan bound for eighteen long years, be set free from bondage on this Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And our reading from Paul's letter to the Hebrews, chapter eight, twelve, chapter twelve, verses eighteen to twenty-nine. You have not come to something that can be touched, a blazing fire, and darkness, and gloom, and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that not another word be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even an animal touches the mountain, it will be stoned to death. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to the Mount of to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse the one who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused the one who warned them on earth, how much less will we escape it if we reject the one who warned from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, 
Yet once more I will shake not only the earth but the heaven. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of what is shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks, by which we offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for indeed our God is a consuming fire. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before I bring our message, my message for this week, let's pray. Father God, I pray the words that I speak will be the words that you want me to speak. And I pray that the words that are heard are the words that you want to be heard. I ask this in the name of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Something strangely unusual happened this week. I say strange because normally it isn't unusual at all, at least in England. This week it rained. I wonder if you can remember where you were when the drops of water last began to fall from the sky. If it didn't fall where you have been this week, it may be quite a challenge to remember given the challenge, given the dryness of the, and the heat of this past month or so. When I was with you last, we were in the beginning of the heat wave. It was certainly a helpful preparation for the heat of the Holy Land and generated much appreciation for the air conditioning on the coach that took us to the places that Jesus went to on foot. In Israel and Palestine, rain is even rarer than it has been here this past month. Indeed, it almost never rains in the summer of their two-season climate. Here, the scarcity of water leads to hosepipe bans. There, it is a source of conflict. Although, sadly, a plentiful supply of water would not likely ease the tension and trouble between those who call those lands their home. That tension and trouble can be seen at the heart of the reading that we've just heard from Paul's letter to the Hebrews. In the passage, Paul contrasts that which can be shaken and that which cannot. He alludes to something the recipients of the letter had not been to, a something that would have been much clearer to them than perhaps it is to us. In place of something, Early copies of the letter spoke to spoke of a mountain that the recipients had had not been to, but one that they would have identified from Paul's following description. That mountain, that something, is Mount Sinai, where the Israelites had first received their covenant law, the Ten Commandments. But no Israelite, save for Moses, went on to that mountain. Exodus chapter 20 verses 18 to 21 records of what Paul summarised in his letter, specifically that when the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Paul contrasts a place that they had not been to with a place that God had invited them to, namely to step foot into the city of the living God 
Now, at first glance, we could be mistaken for thinking that Paul was referring to the enduring importance of Jerusalem. After all, he mentions Mount Zion, which lies just outside the city walls. But there would be no misinterpreting Paul as referring to the earthy Jerusalem for those that listened to that first letter being read out to them. He, they would have not seen it as J Jerusalem being the unshakable kingdom. For he wrote, that's the earthy Jerusalem, I mean, because he wrote the letter only a few decades after the destruction of the second Jewish temple in 70 AD. The location of that temple remains a palpably shaken place. Between Mount Zion and the old Jerusalem's walls lie the archaeological remains of the steps up to that temple which was destroyed. Since the, 17th, since the 7th century, those steps have met the third most holy site for Muslims. For they believe that their prophet Muhammad travelled from Mecca to the site from where he ascended into heaven. I was granted a rare privilege when there a couple of weeks ago and taken by an Islamic leader into the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Alaska Mosque, places non-Muslims rarely get to see. Both they and the ha whole vast plaza are very beautiful, but the shakable nature of this world was plain to see whilst we were there. Although Messianic Jews recognise Jesus as enabling access to the unshakable kingdom that Paul wrote of, Orthodox Jews and Muslims do not. For Orthodox Jews, the coming of the Messiah is tied to the third and final temple being built. And it is not being built? Well, the Messiah has not yet come. And though so, some Jews will not step foot on Temple Mount for the same reasons that no one but Moses stood on Mount Sinai, some will. And their sights are set on playing their part to enable the temple, the third temple, to be rebuilt. Whilst I was there, I witnessed Orthodox Jews being escorted by Israeli soldiers around the site their automatic rifles provocatively protecting those they accompanied. I saw bullet-ridden prayer screens and windows of the Alaska Mosque destroyed by gunfire from the neighbouring Jewish quarter of the city in February this year. Later, I heard from a Jewish guide that in an attempt to shake the Third Temple into being, some tried to smuggle lambs onto the Temple Mount to sacrifice. Their sites and prayers are set on reclaiming the site to the extent that they have the architectural plans ready for building, the, for building contractors to start and a visitor centre open as if the temple has been rebuilt. Not that they are the only group who seek to bring about the unshakable kingdom by shaking up the earthly one. One of the biggest sources of funding for such things in the Holy Land is from Christian groups who believe that recreating biblical Israel fulfills a prophecy that will result in the second coming of Christ. It all creates a tense tinderbox between neighbours and it is illustrative of the danger and consequence that came from rejecting God, which Paul spoke of in the, prof in the passage. Because God has spoken and offered a better way of living now and beyond through what Jesus told us, teach, taught us and modelled to us. The heavenly Jerusalem that Paul wrote of, that all are invited to step foot upon, is and will be unshakable. The law given in a tempest on Mount Sinai was calmed and corrected by Jesus. It was not and is not a covenant of provocation and denial. It was and is a covenant of grace, love and forgiveness. The covenant Jesus enabled was and is offered and open to Jews and Gentiles alike, that is to Jews, Muslims, Christians, indeed all of humanity. 
And it's important to remember that both old and the new law, both Sinai and Zion, both earthly and heavenly, have their source in God. Followers and believers of the three Abrahamic faiths of Judaism, Christianity and Islam seek to follow God faithfully and our different beliefs affect how we act to each other. That is true even within one faith, within one denomination and within one church. What Paul is trying to say by contrasting the transient nature of the world with the permanent nature of God is that by in living in the former our focus must be on the latter. Our focus must be on that which will withstand being shaken, that our ears, ears must be open to the God who has spoken and speaks, and that our behaviour must be modelled on the God who has showed the way to live in both kingdoms. And as we are reminded in church each week at least, that means to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength and to love our neighbours in the same manner that we love ourselves. God does not call us to provoke, inflame or even kill in his name. God calls us to extend to others the grace, love and forgiveness that he gave and gives to us. There is another reason on the unshakable nature of God. Indeed, there are many. But as I travelled home, one in particular stood out. The temporary can occur so often that in our minds it becomes permanent. Things can become so normal that we don't notice that its presence is unusual or should be. The provocation, division and violence in the Holy Land, Ukraine and elsewhere can hide the care and unity and peace that exist between people in those places. The prevalence and normalcy of food banks and long waiting lists for health care may stop us from realising that those things should not be. And when the rain falls so regularly, we can cease to appreciate the blessing that water is to our land and our lives. The rains that we have had this week serve as a reminder not to take things for granted, but to recognise the blessings in our lives that we often fail to see. And I pray that at the end of each day this week, we will all be reminded of the multitude of blessings around us and ask, what we can do with them. Amen. We've come now to a time of prayer, of intercessory prayer. And I'm grateful to Bishop John Pritchard for his prayers, which seems apt for today. The response to the word words Jesus Lord of life is in your mercy hear us Jesus Lord of life in your mercy hear us let's pray Lord, we give you thanks today for so many things. A thousand miracles we take for granted every day. Thank you for the vitality and diversity of the natural world. Thank you for the regularity and stability of the created world. Thank you for the way the body goes on functioning with such remarkable ingenuity. Train our hearts to notice these blessings and be thankful. So we live daily out a deep sense of gratitude and humility. Jesus, Lord of your life, in your mercy, hear us. We know that our world is both wonderful and flawed at every point. We see the symptoms of disordered world in every news broadcast. 
Bless, we pray, those parts of the world which are especially damaged and in need of healing at the moment. Remembering Israel and Palestine and Ukraine at this moment. And all those places known and printed on our hearts and on yours. Give those countries leaders of genuine calibre and the support of the international community and keep us from sin, the sin of thinking that their problems are nothing to do with us. For we all are all children of one heavenly Father, Jesus, Lord of life. In your mercy, hear us. In the church, we so often find, we hope to find a different way of living and sharing together. And so often we are disappointed. The flaw in creation is also in us and in the church. Forgive us for distorting your gospel in our own possession and the likeness of our own prejudices. Give us joyful and generous hearts which allow you to work through us to bring meaning and beauty into your church and world. Persuade us out of our arguments, aspire us out of our pettiness, and set us free to be agents of your kingdom. Jesus, Lord of life, in your mercy hear us. We pray for people in any kind of need, for whom this talk of life in all its fullness would ring very hollow. Be close today to the lonely, the bereaved, the despairing and the desperate. Bless with hope those who are unemployed, homeless, deserted or friendless. Give your deep healing to the sick, the disturbed, the damaged and the lost. And in our hearts, we name in silence some of those who we know to be in dark places today. Jesus, Lord of life, in your mercy, hear us. You came to give us life. And to do so, you had to lay, lay down your own life to bring us back to God. Help us this day to live as those who have been given glo the glorious liberty of children of God and who want to live our lives in gratitude and joy. So make us ready for that day when all that is good is caught up in the life of heaven and Christ that is all in all. Jesus, Lord of of life. In your mercy, hear us. And let us collect our prayers together with the prayer that Jesus taught us. Feel free to say it in English with me, but perhaps you might like to say it in the languages that will appear on screen, though you may need to pause the, the video, this service to do so. There are photos taken at the church of the Pater Nostra, which means for our Father, on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. In this Carmelite monastery, also known as the Sanctuary of the Ilona, they have the Lord's Prayer displayed in around 140 different languages. I wonder which language you would like to see there whether it's already on their walls or yet to be written. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our 
our time together is coming to an end. Let me send you out to take the good news of Christ into the world with a blessing. So may the love of God be the passion in your heart. The joy of God be your strength when times are hard. The presence of God, a peace which overflows. The word of God, the seed that you might sow. And the blessing of God Almighty, Creator, Redeemer and Comforter, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. God bless you. Take care. Goodbye.